Draco Malfoy and the Mortifying Ordeal of Being in Love. Written by Is This Self Care. Narrated by S.E.P. Chapter 7 Ostara, Contrariness of Granger. Draco's next warding visit to Granger's house was marred by what was, in retrospect, a slight lapse in judgment. As weeks had gone by and he had made little further headway on discovering the nature of her research project, his mind turned to a certain object of interest in her study the tattered grimoire on the plinth, the one that she had threatened to cry about. And so, one morning in early March, when Draco was preparing for his perennial visit to Granger's cottage, he sent her a note indicating that he'd be going into her house, if that was all right, because he hadn't warded the windows individually, and it was bothering him. Granger acquiesced with a dry, if you really find it necessary. Yes, he did. Draco timed his visit to coincide with one of Granger's lessons at Trinity to ensure that he wouldn't be disturbed as he snooped. When he arrived, her cat, perhaps sensing something nefarious afoot, took up a position of power on the roof and stared at him as he recast the outside wards. Only doing my job, cat, said Draco, making a great show of it. The cat regarded him with cynicism. He entered the cottage and warded the first floor windows with alacrity, then bounded upstairs to do the others. Granger's bedroom was done first, with minimal looking about, because the cat was at the door and watching him. Then the yoga room. Then, finally, he came to the study. The grimoire was still on the plinth, open in the middle, still surrounded by the green glow of stasis charms. Draco warded the window under the watchful eye of the cat and drifted towards the tome. The cat's stare grew more penetrating. Draco peered at the visible pages. Through the stasis charm, the words were blurred and seemed to dance. The script was labored and heavy. It wasn't English. In fact, bits of it looked French. Anglo-Norman, perhaps? In that case, this was an old book. Five centuries, at least. From the bits that he could understand, he was looking at an elaborate description of a landscape, and green hill under dancing bluebells, and gleaming thistledown, and the velvet-soft leaves of Folly's gossamer. That was all that Draco could make out. The rest of it was too damaged. He remembered Granger's moment of volubility at the Mendip Way. Something about descriptions of Flora giving her clues to her mysterious pursuit. None of the plants mentioned here had featured on her list, however. This must be a different sight. He dearly wanted to see the book's cover. He glanced at the cat. The cat all but shook its head. Just a quick look, said Draco to the cat. I might be able to help her, you know? The cat whisked its tail in disapproval. Draco did it anyway, using his wand as a lever so that he didn't touch the book at all. He lifted the cover enough to peek at the front. It was entitled Revelations. The cat meowed a wrathful meow. Draco let the cover fall back into place and left the cottage rather quickly. Draco didn't know how, but Granger suspected something. First, his jotter went off with a series of messages, questioning him about whether he had touched the book. Draco denied, denied some more, and then stunned the jotter so it would stop buzzing. Then Granger somehow got a hold of Bothius and used Draco's own owl to send him increasingly heated queries. Draco sent Bothius off with a missive to a friend in Italy, which would keep him out of Granger's hands at least for a week. Then, a howler landed on his lap in the middle of a briefing with Tonks. It got as far as, Malfoy, did you? before Draco incinerated it. Tonks' eyebrows rose. Was that Hermione? Yes, said Draco. That explains that, said Tonks. She gestured to the faux glass behind her. One of the shadows looked rather familiar in form. A slender woman, a pile of curls on her head, her hands on her hips, silhouetted against the gray. I suppose she's having violent thoughts about me by proximity to you, said Tonks. What did you do? Nothing, said Draco, which was essentially true. Tonks stared at him for a long time, her fingers tapping against her desk. I will assume that whatever you did was done in your professional capacity as an Auror to ensure her continued protection. That is always my primary objective, said Draco. Tonks gave him another long look, then turned back to his report on the dark artifact smugglers. Be careful, Malfoy. Thus dismissed, Draco returned to his cubicle. He had barely sat down when a silver otter dove at him out of nowhere. It called him a nosy prat and a bloody liar and advised him to jump off a bridge. Draco sent his own Patronus back with a request to Granger to kindly keep her loud otters to herself. He was working. For a short while, that was that. Draco kept an eye on Granger's schedule to spot breaks in her calendar during which she might decide to come and find him in person. She did not, 
possibly because she was saving lives or other such tomfoolery. That was when he noticed that another of her astric holidays was coming up rather soon. That weekend, in fact. So, Ostara is coming up, he jotted casually that evening. Her response was instantaneous, if off-topic. That book was not yours to touch. Where are you going at Ostara? asked Draco. You are not invited, said Granger. Don't need an invitation, said Draco. I do not need supervision by prying nitwits, said Granger. See you soon, said Draco. She didn't respond. Bit pouty sometimes, was Granger. The not-invited prying nitwit had a lovely lie-in on Saturday before getting ready to apparate to Granger. Frankly, after her hijinks with the keepers of the well, she had lost any privileges that might have had to make calls about whether or not she needed or supervision. Draco had no faith that Granger wasn't about to throw herself into a den of vampires to get her hands on some obscure flask. Those virtuous reasons aside, the timing of Granger's weekend escapades continued to serve Draco's purposes. Today, Granger's frolic, whatever it was, coincided with one of his mother's luncheons. Draco was glad of the excuse to be away, even if his mother promised that she had no ulterior motives and that the presence of any young eligible witches would be coincidental. Draco flew to the mitre, the usual Cambridge pub, and from there he apparated to Granger's ring, which brought him to her kitchen. And lo and behold, there was the ring. But there was no Granger. You're bloody joking, said Draco to the ring on the kitchen table. Only the cat responded, a pitiful meow at his mistress's absence. Your witch is a pain in my arse, you know that? The cat curled itself into a sad orange loaf at Draco's feet. Draco pocketed Granger's ring with a mutter. Then he pulled out his wand and cast his tracking charm. Good thing he made contingency plans. In front of him glowed a map, and on that map were points of light brighter than the rest. Granger's old trainers remained, it seemed, in her laboratory at Trinity College. The tea mug was somewhere in this cottage. The handful of her hairpins that Draco had charmed were rather scattered, some at the laboratory, some at St. Mungo's. A single hairpin was currently gambling through Uffington, for reasons unknown reasons that Draco was rather eager to discover. Draco apparated to the hairpin. Surprise, he said as he materialized before Granger. She jumped a meter into the air, which was satisfying, and then swore at him, which was even more satisfying. Draco looked around to find himself at the top of a green, wind-swept hill. It was a strange kind of formation, tall but flat across the top. The turf below his feet was rich, green, and deliciously springy except where it was interrupted by large splotches of chalky white. All around him undulated a lovely vista of reach pasture lands, meandering hedge groves, and wandering sheep paths. Now Draco turned his attention to Granger herself, who was all kitted up in her muggle walking gear. Her hair was in a high ponytail, which lent her a sporty kind of air over her usual scholarly bun. Her nose was pinkened by the march wind. Her brow, of course, was marred by a frown, how the bloody hell are you here? asked Granger. Where are we? asked Draco. How did you find me? What's in your anorak? said Draco, because it looked suspiciously puffy. Granger zipped the anorak a little tighter. Her bright eyes grew dull with a sudden veil of occlusion. Nothing. There, I've answered one of your questions, now you answer mine. That was a lie, though. Well, that's all you're getting from me, said Granger. She began to make her way down the hill and away from Draco. I don't want to speak to you. Don't you? Because you exploded my jotter, commandeered my owl, and then sent me a howler and an angry otter. Oi, where are you going? Away from you, said Granger. Draco was annoyed. Had he missed whatever she'd come here for? Her Astara thing? He must have. She was hippity-hopping her way away from him, looking altogether too pleased. He shouldn't have had quite such a luxurious lion. Granger, get back here. We are not done, said Draco, hippity-hopping behind her down the hill. I'm done here, said Granger with an exaggerated lightness of spirit. Who wouldn't know about you? You need to wear the bloody ring, called Draco to Granger's pouncing ponytail. She clambered on, ignoring him, when without an idea of warning, she bent over. Draco narrowly avoided ramming into her with what would have been full pelvic contact. Yes, Tonks, she broke her neck falling down a hill. I thrust her into her too hard. Yes, it was an accident. Yes, she's dead. Please return my body to my mother in the fewest pieces possible. Granger sprang up again, holding a sprig of something aloft. What's this? she asked. Draco stared at the thing. A uh, plant. Specifically, gossamer. Do you know what kind of gossamer? 
began Draco, remembering the old tomb. Then he caught himself. Frankly, I have no idea. Follies. It's Follies Gossamer. Good for Folly. But you know that, because you read the book. Granger's facade was cracking. She looked slightly manic under it. Draco waved the plant away. Taking the ring off wasn't in our agreement. You're to keep it on at all times. That's the entire point. Granger, who had turned to continue her descent, whipped back around. Her ponytail slapped Draco in the face, a severe injury for which she did not even remotely apologize. Do you know what else wasn't in our agreement? You breaching my trust and touching my things! Ah, there it was, the shrieking. I didn't do anything to your book. You weren't to touch it in the first place. That book is beyond price. Whipping around again, and hitting him in the face with her hair again, Granger stormed down the hill. Put the damned ring back on, Granger, said Draco. No, I am through with your surveillance device. Fine, called Draco to her retreating back. I'll tell Shacklebolt that I am through, and he'll have you actually put in under surveillance, with Aurors who will literally watch you around the clock. Every move, every fucking vial of what's-its you pour in your laboratory, every word you plonk into your computers. Granger stopped. She made a strangled noise. Draco took that as agreement. He stomped towards her. Hand, he said. Granger stuck out her hand. Draco grabbed it roughly. He wanted to put the ring on equally roughly to show her how cross he was. But he didn't, out of fear of breaking her finger. There was a moment of blessed shriek-free silence while he slipped the ring back on. Oh, came a voice. Some muggle walkers had just popped around the side of the hill. Cries of delight followed. An engagement! And what a lovely couple! And congratulations! And what a beautiful spot for it! Anyway, Draco hadn't known that a Vada Kedavra could be cast using only one's eyes, but Granger was doing it quite competently. Then she turned to the muggles and made some sounds of agreement and false joy to move them along. Draco did not join in because he was dead. The walkers eventually bimbled off, having wished them well in their wedded life, and provided inane advice to Draco. Granger was gasping her sprig of gossamer destructively. As soon as the muggles left, she flung it at the ground and asked why this was her life. Draco assumed that the question was rhetorical, and so he did not respond. He pulled out his wand and walked to where the muggles had rounded the corner. What are you doing? asked Granger. I'm going to obliviate them, said Draco. Don't, said Granger with an unexpected vehemence. <sighs> Memory charms are not to be used lightly. But now Granger was beside him. She snatched his wand hand and pulled it down. Don't. It doesn't matter. I promise you that those muggles won't be tarnishing your reputation or going to the Prophet with this. This supposed development. I don't care, said Draco, because he didn't. I thought you cared. You just garroted me with your eyes. You don't care, Granger looked for once in her life, perplexed. I thought you'd care. Why would I care? They're muggles. I don't know. Never mind. Are we done here? Are you done here? Yes, said Granger. And so am I, said Draco. Granger stamped off through a kissing gate to the car park. Draco lingered long enough to watch her maneuver the car off the grassy verge and onto the winding country road. She drove off without a backwards glance. Her registration plaint said, Crookshanks. Draco disapparated with an irritated crack. A few days later, Draco got ready for Wednesday night Quidditch, which he hosted at the manor's well-manicured pitch. Kitted up and ready to go, he flew towards the pitch where the usual miscreants were waiting. Sabini, Davies, Flint, Doyle, and some other old schoolmates, and a handful of whatever players they rounded up for tonight's game. Oi, oi, waved Flint. The Chief Tuff has arrived, announced Doyle. Wind your neck in, Doyle, or I shall do it for you, said Draco, angling his broom down to their altitude. Doyle raised his beater's bat at Draco in mock threat. I'm more equipped to be bashing heads in. Five on five? asked Davies, edging his broom between them and obviously eager to get started. Let's do it. They played. It was after eight when they started, but the pitch was magically illuminated and permitted a long game full of questionable rule interpretations and feats of near death. The snitch was an elusive thing that night. Neither Malfoy nor the opposing seeker had much luck, and they were both subjected to taunting by their teams as a result. Midnight came around, and Davies said, Shit, the missus was going to have his head for staying out for so late. They agreed to call it a draw, given the uselessness of their seekers, and the otherwise even score, and to carry on next week and celebrate the eventual winner with too much drink. Pops and cracks reverberated across the pitch as the players disapparated home, leaving Draco with the whole thing to himself. Now he could have some fun. 
he flew lazily upward in long loops, farther and farther up, until the pitch was a green rectangle far below, and the manor was a doll's house softly glowing in the night. Then he angled his broom down and plummeted into the Ronsky faint. He pulled up at the last minute, barely holding in the whoop of joy that wanted to burst through his lips, spiraled his broom back towards the black sky. Once again, the pitch was a small green rectangle below, and Draco flew up even higher, until he fancied there might have been wisps of clouds between him and the earth. He dropped again, relishing the wind on his face, the paralyzing sensation of the plummet, the adrenaline bursting in his veins. It was glorious. It was freedom. He pulled out of the dive at the last moment possible, his heart singing in his ears, his toes clipping the grass. The soft but distinctive pop of an apparition echoed across the pitch. He looked about for who it was, ready to tease Davies for running away from his wife. But it was not Davies. It was Granger. Had she come to berate him about that damned book? Draco flew in low and drew his broom to a hovering halt in front of her. What the hell are you doing here? But Granger didn't look angry. She looked confused. Her wand was held aloft, sparking green, healing sparks. In fact, she looked as though she just rolled out of bed. Her hair was in a long plate, rife with escaping curls. She wore muggle shorts and a large, well-worn University of Edinburgh jumper. Her legs and feet were bare. I... I felt you, she stammered, gazing about at her new surroundings in bewilderment. Your heart rate spike was through the roof, and your adrenaline spiked, and it was horrid. I... No, it was wicked, corrected Draco, still catching his breath. I thought you were about to die. Hang on. How did you feel it? How the hell are you even here? The bloody ring, said Granger, waving her hand with the ring in question in his face. Impossible, scoffed Draco. It's only one way. Then how am I here, you utter crumpet? This was a fair point, and Draco was forced to consider that he might have had to revisit the charms. His ire rose, however, because the malfunction was most certainly her fault. The only crumpet here is the one who took off the ring when she wasn't meant to and damaged something. That spell work is delicate. Granger held her hands aloft, as though she couldn't believe the absurd turn of the conversation. I didn't come here to argue about who was the bigger crumpet. It's you, said Draco, and since you came barreling here in your pajamas to ascertain my well-being, I can confirm that I am fine. You can go now. I'm sure you have better things to do. This statement of fact was apparently the wrong thing to say. Granger's shriekiness increased. Better things to do? Me? Oh, no. My life is a lovely plinky-plonky time. Granger, I love nipping down to the Critch pitch in the middle of the night, in March, barefoot, to the insults of Draco fucking Malfoy. Positively adore it. I have so little to do, I've been thinking of taking up lawn bowling. Ships in a bottle. She cut herself off, having mercifully been interrupted by something touching her neck. She flinched away. What is... At the nape of her neck, glinting teasingly at Draco, was the snitch. Draco glided closer and plucked it away. Been looking for this bugger all night. Wonderful. So glad I could help, said Granger. Her teeth were clenched, but it wasn't out of anger. Draco belatedly realized it was from the cold. She took a breath and appeared to be assembling what remained of her dignity. Since you are quite all right, might you take me to the nearest flu? Why the hell did she need him to take her anywhere? Draco landed beside her, realizing at last that Granger did not look well. She was white-lipped, pale and shivering. Did you apparate from bloody Cambridgeshire? asked Draco with dawning comprehension. It took a few sets, said Granger through her clenched teeth. I did a double shift at St. Mungo's this morning, so between that and long-distance apparation, I'm rather drained. Draco cast a warming charm on her. His irritation at the situation was now giving way to anger. She had depleted herself of far too much magic on his account, the reckless idiot. What exactly was the plan when you arrived to save my life with almost no magical reserves? I was going to put a plaster on the injury, said Granger, but the sarcasm was blunted by the violent tremble that shook her shoulders. Sod off with the lecturing. I wasn't thinking. I was asleep, and the next thing I knew, this damned ring was screaming at me that you were about to die. Draco felt that he should be touched though his displeasure at her imprudence rather shadowed it. Right. So I might have been in the middle of a duel with a gang of dark wizards, and you decided to pop along barefoot, magicless, in your gym jams. Bloody brilliant. It was a reaction, hissed Granger. Sorry I didn't pause to evaluate my options when I thought you were in the middle of dying. I'm a healer. Odds were strong that I'd have been able to do something about your... your... 
my non-existent grievous injury? Right. Draco hopped back onto his broom and drew her near. Get on. I'll fly you to the manor. You can flew home from there. No, said Granger, backing away. Draco assumed, with no small degree of exasperation, that her objection was the flying. Fine, he jumped back off his broom and held his elbow out her, to her instead. I'll apparate us to the manor. Let's go, you look about to faint. Granger backed away again. She looked even paler. No, not the manor, please. Apparate me to the swan. I'll flew from there. What's wrong with my bloody flu? asked Draco, close to losing his patience, and snatching her arm to force a side along. My mother's in France this week, if that's what you're... No, it's not your mother. I just... I just don't want to go back there, all right? She wrapped her arms around herself. At this moment, the formidable Hermione Granger looked small, pale, and afraid. Draco realized, horridly late, that it was his home she was objecting to, that the manor still held the horrors of the war. He was an idiot. He offered his elbow again. The swan, then. She took it. Her hand was light on his arm and against his sweat-soaked quidditch kit, it felt cold. They apparated into the cloakroom of the swan, the boisterous wizarding pub that served as a waypoint for Welcher flu travel. The voices of the pub patrons rumbled cheerfully through the walls. Draco cast a notice-me-not on himself and Granger, which served to avert gazes from them as they exited the cloakroom and made their way to the hearth. Draco noticed that Granger was still holding his elbow. In fact, she had begun to lean on him. He tossed a handful of flu powder into the fire, and Granger gave the name of the wizarding pub nearest her cottage, the Mitre. You haven't enough to, in you to apparate home from there, said Draco. My cottage isn't on the flu network. I was going to walk. It's only a few minutes, said Granger. Draco made a sound of disbelief. You've proven that you're an idiot once tonight, but I see you're doubling down. I'm coming with you. It was evidence of the true level of Granger's fatigue that she did not argue the point. They stepped into the hearth together and were spun and jostled along two dozen fireplaces until they were spat out at the mitre. Draco was quicker to find his footing than the exhausted idiot of a witch, who made a brave attempt at standing that was more of a sideways collapse into him. He snaked an arm around her waist and apparated them to her kitchen. The orange blur whizzed into the room as the crack of Draco's apparition echoed. There was an immediate meow of concern as the cat noted the sagging form of his mistress against Draco's side. Are you still with us? asked Draco, giving Granger a jostle. Should I call someone? Should I take you to St. Mungo's? Say something, or I shall send my Patronus to Potter and launch a whole-scale panic. Don't. Granger's grip on his arm tightened. It's just... it's just magical exhaustion. I spent all day healing. The long-distance apparitions were... stupid. Give me a replenishing potion, the reddish vial on the counter there. Draco propped Granger up on a chair, where she sat back with a sigh. He floated the vial in question towards them and snapped off its waxy stopper. I am the utter crumpet, said Granger before downing the entire thing. Draco felt that he ought to get that in writing. The cat was wanding its way around Granger's feet with a chorus of anxious meows. I agree, said Draco. She needs rest. You don't understand him, said Granger, dropping the empty vial onto the table with a feeble gesture. Stop pretending. He said there's a sofa somewhere under that mess of books in the front room that you should go lay down on. Do not touch those books, said Granger, combative through even her faintness. The cat made a sustained wail. Bed, then. I concur, said Draco. Draco didn't give Granger a chance to object. He slipped one hand into the crook of her elbow and apparated them both upstairs, where he deposited her onto her bed. It was obvious, as he looked around the dim room, that Granger had indeed departed in as much of a hurry as she claimed to. The bed was in disarray, as though she had forgotten that she had had a blanket over her when she leapt to her feet. The bedside lamp was askew, as though she'd hit it. Her muggle mobile device was face down on the floor. Draco rearranged these things with a few wand waves. The cat, which had bounded up the stairs after them, leapt onto the bed and joined Granger with a reproachful sound. The cat settled into Granger's armpit like a furry water bottle. Granger pulled the cover over herself with a weak hand and stroked the cat's head with the other. Draco, who had been waiting to see if the replenishing potion was having the desired effect, and that Granger wasn't going to die on his account, suddenly felt as though he was intruding. He took a step towards the door. Right, I'm going to go now. Mind you don't do that again. I'm sorry, said Granger, for being complicated about your house. I don't care, said Draco. It doesn't matter. I know that the awful things that happened there are ancient history. You don't need to keep excusing yourself. 
Go to sleep, said Draco, taking a bigger step towards the door. I know it's not rational, said Granger, making an irresolute gesture to the ceiling. But... Stop thinking, Granger, said Draco, even though he knew that that was an oxymoron of a request. He walked out of the room. Bye. It was just to use the flu, said Granger softly, mostly to herself now. Bit pathetic, really. Draco took a long step back into the room. Somehow he couldn't let that one slide. It's not pathetic to not want to revisit the place where you were tortured. He wanted to add, you idiot, but he felt that he may have maximized his quota on that front tonight. Granger said, hmm, in an absent way. Anyway, said Draco, much of the manor was destroyed at the end of the war. That entire half is gone. The drawing room is gone. It's gone? asked Granger of the ceiling. Yes, it's just gardens now. Greenhouses, flowers, medicinal herbs. What herbs? asked Granger. Why did she have to know everything in excruciatingly bloody detail? She was exhausting. I don't know, said Draco. My mother donates the useful stuff to apothecaries. Go to sleep. That's good. Granger's voice had taken on a softer, more absent quality. The replenishing potion was knocking her out to begin its work. Yes. I'm happy that something good could have come out of such a... Such a terrible place, supplemented Draco. Yes. She said nothing further for a few moments. The moonlight through the window caught her face in soft light. Delicate, wide-eyed, still pale. Her hair was a dark coil across the pillow, slowly unfurling. Draco felt as though he were seeing double, and her oversized jumper tucked up in a bed with her hands over the blanket. She looked like the girl he remembered from school, but that vision dissipated to live, leave him with his portrait of a lovely, tired witch who had brought herself to the brink of total magical depletion to get to him because she thought he was in danger. She had done this to herself for him. It was a peculiar sensation. Granger's eyelids began to drift downwards. Draco edged toward the door, intending to leave the cottage by foot before disapparating outside as quietly as he could. She was asleep now, certainly. She had been quiet too long. Malfoy, Draco muttered a curse, you are meant to be sleeping. Now her words were blurred at the edges. She was drifting towards unconsciousness, but still fighting it. Your Patronus is lovely, said Granger. Her eyes were closed. Uh, thanks? What is it? Go to sleep, Granger. But what is it? Sleep. Is it a kind of a dog? Yes, go to sleep. What kind? A borzoi. Oh, the czars used to have those. They did. Go to sleep. This isn't a pub quiz. He's a rude thing. So he's pretty. I'm leaving now, said Draco. His fur looked so soft. Finally, silence fell. Now only the cat was awake, staring at Draco. Draco noted that the yellow stare was not as hate-filled as it usually was. If anything, it seemed approving. 